background help you think? Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus and tonight I'm proud to bring you Witchcraft and Theurgy with Brandy Williams. Greetings, Brandy. Thank you, Hercules. And I'm very pleased to have Don Fru as our guest tonight. Don Fru has an extensive um, uh, CV. He is an elder in both the Gardnerian and Nruvd traditions of neo-pagan witchcraft. And he's the high priest of Coven Trismegistan in Berkeley. Did I get that right? Yeah, it means the, co the coven of the of the thrice greatest ones. And you can decide whether that means our gods or the coven members. <laughs> okay. Uh, he served several terms as first officer or public information officer for Covenant of the Goddess, which is the largest religious organization for witches. He's currently a national interfaith representative for COG, and he has represented COG and the craft in interfaith work for nearly four decades. He served on the boards of the Berkeley Area Interfaith Council and the Interfaith Observer, on the Global Council of the United Religious Religions Initiative, which is the world's largest grassroots interfaith organization, and in the Assembly of the World's Religious and Spiritual Leaders as part of the Parliaments of the World's Religions. He's the founder and director of the Lost and Endangered Religions Project and a founder and president of the Adocentin Research Library. So welcome. And uh, we're so, we're, when, when, we, uh, when we put this show together, you were the first person I thought of because we met, um, well, we've, we met eons ago, you, you're, you're, you signed my coven, Coven of the Mystical Merkaba, you signed our, our COG charter. <laughs> oh, so we, I didn't remember that, thank you. Yeah, we've, we've known each other since the, the late 80s, but um, in particular, you were at the first Theurgicon that was held in the Bay Area, and that was where you had presented on Witchcraft and Theurgy. So when we started talking about the show, I said, oh, we've got to have Don. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for making the time for us. I'm very pleased to do so. And uh, I, I just noticed that Anna jumped on. That's my wife for Hercules, who doesn't know. And we wasn't we weren't sure if this was an on like live thing or you were recording or what. So she was wanting to see it. But um, ah. however you want to. We are recording. So um, Anna, if you if you talk, it will be recorded. <laughs> but this is not live. It's uh, it will go up on Zoom after um, when, when Hercules get, gets a chance to post it, usually within a day. Mm -hmm. And Anna's so, the high priestess of Kevin Trismegistin, so we're doing. And, and accompanied you on some of your journeys. We hope Pretty to much get everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, there were at least one term, Brandy, where we were on the board of Cog together. When and you were first the, officer. And that's was, the deer yeah. in the headlights look of, of an old person thinking, "Hmm, what year was that?" Do you think? <laughs> I don't remember, but it was there was some time yeah. ago. But at, at least one term, you were first officer, and I was PIO. You must have been the PIO. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, so let's get, get started with the witchcraft and theurgy, and we have a set of questions that we ask everyone. The first one is, you know, first two are pretty obvious. What is witchcraft? So how do you understand witchcraft? Okay, and, and I'm going to warn you, and I'm glad this is a recorded thing for this reason. As I was going through the questions you asked, and I'm thinking about it, hmm, going, hmm, that's a presentation, you know, and I'm kind of going, how, you know, how, do, I, how do I sort of kind of crunch this down? Um, so I'll, I'm doing my best, but if this runs too long, just, you know, kick me upside the head, you know. Um, th that question, what is witchcraft, used to be a straightforward one. And I was public information officer for COG through the 80s and, and 80s and 90s. That was a nice, simple question. And back then, I would usually say something like, uh, neo-pagan witchcraft, often called Wicca or the craft, is a life-affirming, earth and nature-oriented spiritual path, honoring divinity in female as well as or instead of male forms, and practicing magic as part of a spiritual practice. And I used to say, the easiest way to grasp Wicca might be to think of Native American or Shinto or Hindu spirituality, but with a predominantly European cultural context. Knowing that that was like, oh boy, is there a whole can of worms in there? But for like an elevator speech, that would usually get it through. And nowadays, of course, there's a lot of problems with this. Um, Neo-pagan witchcraft was pretty much the only game in town back then. So it was easy to speak in general terms about witchcraft, and be mostly accurate about most witches. And there've been a lot of changes since then. Uh, a good friend of mine, Brooks Alexander, who was an evangelical Christian writer, was asked to update the book, uh, Witchcraft, A History of Witchcraft, Sorcerers, Heretics, and Pagans. And they said, but we need to update the last two chapters. Could you do this? The author was an evangelical Christian, so they turned to an evangelical Christian to do the update. And he was working with me and he said, you know, the problem is, you guys have gone through more religious change in your first 50 years than Christianity went through in its first 250. 
and it's true, you know, and we're changing rapidly, especially being born right on the cusp of the internet. And so it's hard to keep up. One of the reasons I stopped doing public information work is it was so hard to speak in a representative way. Um, many other pagan spiritualities have become prominent, especially heathenry and Kemeticism, um, including many paths that don't want to be called pagan. Uh, the development of what's, what is called British traditional witchcraft, as opposed to British traditional Wicca, has highlighted many who identify as witches, but don't describe their witchcraft as a religion or spiritual practice. So nowadays, if I was asked to say, what is witchcraft, I might take that old, really old definition and kind of flip it around and say, witchcraft is a life-affirming earth, earth and nature oriented magical path incorporating traditional and or oral and written lore that may or may not be part of a spiritual path. Because mm -hmm. right? there's now a lot of people out there who are, who are saying they're witches, but they're not thinking of it as their, as their religion. The religious and the magical aspects were like that when the movement started. So, but not anymore. And I really count on you for those definitions too and have for the whole time that I've known you. And I, I, I recently did a keynote for the Women in Magic conference where what I, I, I realized that I, I can't really talk about um, definitions like that. What I did was I gave my life history mm -hmm. as a history of how the craft has changed. And it is just fascinating how much change we've gone through. So it's a, it's a good call out actually. Um, well, and, and what saved me kind of, is uh, my work started out as public information and it was like with the government and the police and media and, and interfaith, you know, and interfaith, you know, as someone who attended the parliament um, in 93, interfaith has a way of taking over your life. And increasingly it became all I was doing was interfaith work. And after 1993, global interfaith changed considerably from being about, oh, what does this group think? Who's their official representative to speak for them? to we're all in this together. How does, it, how does your religion shape you and who you are and what you do? And so I can speak as, well, I'm a witch of this kind and here's what my witchcraft means. And I'm a part of this group. That doesn't mean that's what everybody in that group does or everybody in that group thinks. And everyone knows that, everyone understands that. So with that kind of freedom to speak more about my own kind of witchcraft, um, it was easier to continue doing representative kind of work, um, especially in this sort of both relates and is a digression. I've been really fascinated by the connection between traditional British kind of Wicca, and we'll get into that, what that means, and Islam. And that connection is largely through, I think, a shared route that goes back to late antiquity. Mm -hmm. um, and that ideas of, of, ideas of Drichton in traditional Wicca and ideas of Allah in Islam often get to something that's much more of an impersonal uh, source, a one, than like the God of Christianity. And so in many ways, we're, we're much closer to each other. And when I can speak about the way I understand things, like I said, a friend of mine in, in Islam referred to me as being part of greater Islam. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a story there we can get into later if you want to go down the Islam path. Um, but the... Uh, the kind of witches now, some of whom are what we would call radical polytheists, you know, say, no, 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 there's no unity behind us. It's individual discrete gods. That would be an abomination. <laughs> so it's weird to be speaking for a religious group that on one side, this, your, your people are listening to you would include as part of their own religious group. And on the other side would consider an abomination. And yet somehow for us, that's one thing. Yeah. So it gets complicated. There are friends. Well, I'd like to go to one place in particular then because of the paper you wrote, um, Gardnerian Wicca as, as Theurgic Ascent. Mm -hmm. And we can ask what, what is Gardnerian Wicca to you? Okay. Um, let, me, let me drop into another little bit of digression about Wicca because okay. I think that it's, it's gotten complicated. Um, when Gardner was initiated in a group in the New Forest in 1939, he was welcomed into something called the Brotherhood of the Wicca with one C. He wasn't welcomed into the craft. So that it was the Brotherhood of the Wicca. And that's the way he spelled it in his first nonfiction book, Witchcraft, Witchcraft Today. He later decided on his own and as an amateur folklorist that this was the word, same as the Anglo-Saxon word Wicca with two Cs, which from hence we get the word witch. Um, and he started using that as the word for what things were. 
uh, with all the attendant folk etymologies about it being, oh, these were the wise people and all of that. But it was he, he that made the shift from Wicca to one C, Wicca with two Cs. And one of the really weird things about that is that he, he writes that the group he joined absolutely detested Anglo-Saxons. And yet the only two Anglo-Saxon words that show up in Gardnerian craft are Wicca, the name for the organs, the, the path itself, and Drichten, the name for the ultimate divine. And you kind of go, that's kind of weird, you know, unless you were kind of mishearing these things and you were making a shift. So I think both of those lead down long paths. Um, as the movement took off and spread to the United States, people started calling all of us witches and referred to the Brits as Wiccans. And like people from Italy were striking. Then as we became more public and people were coming out to their parents, they thought, oh, it's easier to use one W word in place of the other W word and tell their parents, oh, I'm a Wiccan, not a witch. And so Wicca became synonymous with witchcraft and Wiccan with witch. Then the TV Ch Sir Charmed appeared on the scene and created a new way of looking at it. <laughs> so they're on the good side, you had the whole, oh, we have the bewitched phenomenon again, which is, hey, isn't it great that the advertisers are vying to be associated with a show about witches? But they created the idea that the sisters were innate witches with innate magical powers. And they had Wiccans on the show in a positive way, except the Wiccans were amateurs who were sort of trying to figure out how magic worked and they were lucky if a spell worked at all. And so that created a dichotomy of witch magic, Wiccan belief. Mm -hmm. And so now we have people who are saying they're a witch, but not Wiccan. Okay, fine. Or I'm Wiccan, but not a witch, which I kind of go, you know, that doesn't work for me at all. So in the face of this, some groups have started trying to reclaim the word Wicca with one C, as you wrote in the question to me, to refer specifically to people who have a lineage of initiation going back to the group Gardner joined. Hmm. Um, because surprisingly, we are aware of other groups that descended from that group that are not Gardnerians. So we use Wicca with one C to kind of refer to us as cousins, if you will. Not all Brits, just people who descend from the group Gardner joined. So Gardnerian Wicca, and it's appropriate that Anna's popped up in there because uh, she wrote the essay on the Gardnerian tradition for the COG webpage. Um, and I couldn't come up with a better description than to paraphrase what she wrote in that essay, uh, which is to say that Gardnerian witchcraft is a tradition taught by Gerald Gardner and, and his initiates, largely as it was passed on from his original coven. Gardnerian is a person who's had a Gardnerian initiation administered by someone empowered to do so in a line of descent tracing in an unbroken lineage of initiations and elevations back to Gardner, utilizing a particular and consistent body of teaching and liturgy. The details of Gardnerian practice are oath-bound and may not be revealed to non-initiates, which makes talking about it on shows like this lots of fun. Yeah. Because I always have to sort of go, okay, I'm approaching, I'm approaching, I'm teetering on the edge of it, okay. Um, Practices common to Gardnerian covens include possessory workings called drawing down the moon. They sometimes say drawing down the sun when referring to invoking the god in priests, even though drawing down the moon has a classical meaning that we know. And it's so saying drawing down the sun is not quite the right thing. But anyway, it's called that. Um, studying and preserving the Book of Shadows and its contents, cultivating relationships with deities and spirits that are considered specifically sacred to the tradition. So by becoming a member of the tradition, you have a relationship with them um, and spell work, which includes herbal lore and things like that. Um, Gardnerian craft follows a lengthy course of study involving magical practice, the oaths, memorization of traditional scripts and, and more. After three degrees of initiation and elevation, an elder may what's called hive uh, to form an independent daughter coven in, in a continuous lineage. There's no central authority in Gardnerian witchcraft. Each, each coven is autonomous, but most people, most Gardnerians view the tradition in the context of an extended family. Um, and that's why Gardnerians, as they're initiated, learn what's called their lineage, which is, this is your lineage going back through the people who initiated you and initiated them back to Gardner. Um, and by knowing your lineage and somebody else knowing their lineage, you can kind of go, nah, 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 ah, we've got the same person right there. And then you can kind of figure out in sort of a family tree ray way exactly how you're related. Um, and that makes maybe more like a tribe um, than a family, but certainly with all the divisions that families have. Um, but still this underlying sense of connection um, that's largely based through that, you know, that lineage. Um, I was very, very happy 
that after a Pantheacon several years back, we had at our house for full moon, both Philip Heselton, you know, who's a gardenerian in, in the UK of current practice, and Dionys, who was one of Gardner's late priestesses, um, who had left the coven in the, uh, around 1960-ish, I'm not sure, Anna probably knows the, the date, and then was completely disconnected from craft, like living in the Bahamas, I think it was, and then Canada, and like didn't even, didn't even know people like Gardnerians existed until she popped up on AOL and saw a Gardnerian chat log and went, Gardnerian, that must have something to do with Gerald. Um, <laughs> and, we re and we reconnected with her. And we thought, we said to her at one point, I remember the language, we said, you should really come to Pantheacon sometime and see what you've wrought. You know, because almost everything there descends from her, in, all, everything which Wiccan there descends from her in some way. And so we have both her from 50 years earlier, 60 years earlier uh, in the circle, and Philip from the other side of the world in the circle. And they were all saying, no, 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 you guys just do it. We're fine. You know, we can just be guests. But I was standing with them. And every time as someone was, was doing part of the circle, doing a consecration, calling something, I was listening to them mouthing the words on either side of me. And they were, they, they were there right with us. And so there's this very clear sense of connection. I and mean, here's the other side of the world. And here's in the past. And yet there's still that sameness. And so that, I think, is a real strength for a lot of people who like that there's other people who really like hey i want to you know come from my heart and create something new every time cool if that's what you like go for it um but people who are drawn to it find that sense of uh initiatory community you know not just that you've memorized the same scripts but you've gone through the same you know that person has gone through the same ritual experiences um, and especially if the person is a third degree that's critical because that's where as we'll mention the issue of possession comes up. Um, possessory work, I think, really is at the heart of Gardnerian craft, which is all, for some people always, always a surprise. I'm, you know, like like you said, there was a surprise that oh, what would guard, what would witches have to do with theurgy? I'm mm -hmm. always was always surprised when there was a panel on possession or something at Pantheacon, and uh, someone would mention that one of us should be there, and they say, why would they? What would they have to do with it? And it's like, well, that's at the center of what we do. Uh, I give a, a friend of mine, Lane Little, is a professor of South Asian studies, and he would give a class on sort of more popular aspects of Indian religion, um, rather than say Brahmanic, Brahminic aspects. And uh, there would be a class on possession, and he would always ask me to come in to talk about possession in a Western magical ceremonial context compared to possession in their context to sort of compare and contrast. Because uh, Lane had experienced it in the South Asian context. And, you know, I've experienced it in the Gardnerian context as well as a few others. Um, and so we wanted to talk about that experience and compare it. So anyway, I hope that answers the question. That is great. Um, and that actually leads us to our next sort of question. I, I've uh, referred to your paper, Gardnerian Wicca as Theurgic Ascent. So mm -hmm. now we can have the second question, you know, in a show of witchcraft and theurgy, what's theurgy? And in particular, how did you get into in, interested in Neoplatonic theurgy? And then um, how do you understand it? What are the core concepts that you understand? Um, let me go for, go for how I got into it. Um, and this is very much related to, uh, I, I, I am probably known for making extravagant claims. Uh, that there is this connection between not, you know, not just, oh, we do theur a theurgic practice, but that there's a connection between us and late antiquity. Um, and I've, I've never said, oh, if there's a there's a group that was practicing them that kept practicing for all this time. No, I believe that there are co certain core concepts that have in fact been passed from one person to another. Um, and I think those are, what is the basic cosmology? Um, who are the gods that you relate to? Uh, how do you relate to them? And I think that Come, is basically through drawing them into a person and drawing them into an object. And as far as I know, that's an unusual thing for modern craft to have a tradition of drawing the gods into an object um, and the basics of how a, how a circle works. That's pretty much it. Everything else is then being elaborated by the culture and the land that that core concept finds itself in. One thing, it's going through a bunch of languages, you know, so it's going to, to change. But I think those core ideas have stuck together. And I've been accused of only finding evidence that supports that. Hmm. Uh, 
and so I would say that putting putting aside the fact that if the theory is correct, you would only find evidence that supports it, uh, which I've always thought, well, the the. <laughs> um, I actually started out completely the other way. Uh, when I got involved in the '70s, I fell for the whole Murray type story. Mm -hmm. you know? um, then I learned that that really didn't hold a lot of water, and I learned it secondhand about Aidan Kelly's work and decided that the craft was most likely a modern invention by Gardner, but it worked anyway, so who cares? Then he published Crafting the Art of Magic. And when I read it, I found it to be so full of errors and internal contradictions, um, not to mention the altering of documents, which I only discovered later when I got to access to the documents myself, um, that I decided Gardner didn't make it all up. But then where did it come from? And his point, Kylie's point about, well, where's the historical precedent was a good one and the obvious choice for which has been Celt, Celtic. Um, but Hutton had made a pretty good argument in Pagan Religions of the Ancient British Isles that the craft doesn't descend from Celtic religion. So while working at Shambhala, at Shambhala Booksellers in the early 90s, I stumbled upon a book on late, an article actually on late antique Neoplatonic, Neoplatonic theurgy while perusing a, a new book called uh, Religion, Science, and Magic in Concert and Conflict. And it was an anthology by Jacob Neusner and some other folks. Mm -hmm. And there was an article in there called Theurgy and Forms of Worship and Neoplatonism by George Luck. And he was pretty, it was a synthesis of, you know, in general, what can we say about theurgy and the way people did rituals and ceremonies across Neoplatonism, recognizing that we're talking about a significant time span and geographic span. Um, and people who had very different views of theurgy. And I was reading his sort of synthesis about it. And I thought at the time, I was thinking, wow, I said, you know, change the names from Greco-Roman to Celtic and these folks could be Gardnerians. And so that sort of, you know, went ping in my head because I'd never really looked at Neoplatonism before that. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciated, which he made clear in the article was that, okay, there's certain core concepts but every one of these teachers, you know, Plotinus and Iamblichus and Proclus and Damascus and all these others, they're doing their own thing and they're having their own experiences. And each of them is then coming up with their own approach and their own understanding of the world, but they're still holding certain ideas in common. So much so that they could speak with each other and they could write, correspond with each other and say, well, you know, I see it this way, more, I see it this way. And it wasn't an issue of you're wrong and I'm right, but we've had different experiences of the same thing and we're discussing it in different ways. Proclus was obsessed, you know, with henads and levels and wanting to finally pick things apart. Um, you know, someone like, like Iamblichus didn't care about that as much, um, you know, with, and was very concerned with traditional cult. Um, mm. And that was okay. Um, and that aspect of it, I, I thought was very, you know, attractive. The fact that there were women involved I thought was very important. Um, the fact that it was very cosmopolitan. Um, you know, it, I would not, it happened to be ha happening in, in the Roman Empire, but it wasn't specifically Roman. If anything, the, the Neoplatonists were very open to saying, you know, if the one is basically manifesting everything, then everything is, has contains aspects of the one, everything has something to teach us. Mm -hmm. So that very cosmopolitan open view was something I'm going, you know, these are all things that fit us very well and are also very, very appealing. So, but, so this led me to wonder, was there an actual connection between late antique ne uh, Neoplatonists and us? And it seemed very unlikely. So at the time I was just thinking, well, we're trying to do the same thing in a very similar setting, talking to the same gods. Maybe they're just telling us the same thing. You know, that could be. But then two things happened. The first was that I think as people in classics started running out of things to write about, uh, people turned towards theurgy um, and there was, and it became a hot topic. And for a while there, I found it very, very amusing. If you remember Dodd's, uh, The Greeks and the Irrational, and he had the appendix on basically, oh, and you know, in the late days, people got so degenerate and superstitious that they created this stuff, theurgy, and isn't that ridiculous? Ha ha ha. Yeah. Um, such that a lot of the early writers on theurgy basically had to spend a couple of pages saying, let me stop and explain why Dodds is wrong. You know, and everyone had to, had to do that because Dodds was so much taken for granted as being the truth. Um, and then with, you know, people like uh, Afanasiadi and Graf and uh, uh, Majicic and, you know, all these others, 
were all doing the same thing. Um, and so it became a hot topic. And suddenly people were writing about theurgy and doing investigation of texts that had been largely ignored. At the same time, Anna and I started getting access to many of the earliest documents of the Gardnerian tradition, Gardner's books of shadows, his notebooks, his scrapbooks, his correspondence, where we could learn more and more about what did he inherit versus what did he and Doreen shape and what came out the other end? Because one of the real problems with looking at early craft and origins of craft was taking at face value what it had become by the 60s and saying, oh, what's, what's the origin of this thing? Right. That's, that's a dead end. You know, any, the history of any secret society is going to be, the way I put it is, you know, what they've actually been given is the clay. What they shape that clay into is where they think they've come from. And very, and so a lot of the people, 50s and 60s forwards, were looking towards Celtic stuff. They were even looking towards Templar stuff, and they were remolding this stuff in new ways. And I mean, we know, for example, that the that the the eightfold wheel, I mean, the eightfold uh, wheel of the year, was something that developed in the late 50s. You know, so to try to look, oh well, who has an eightfold wheel calendar going back? That's a waste of time. You have to look and say, what's the earliest? form of this manifestation that we know. And that's trying to track down what did Gardner inherit, what was given to him. And looking at that and comparing that to what we were learning about the theurgy of late antiquity, these things were meshing together very closely. Um, and at the same time, one of the things that I thought was very interesting is you can always say, uh, oh God, what's, how's it go? Um, absence of evidence is not evidence, mm. uh, except when something should be there and it isn't. And if Gardnerian craft was a product of the middle of the 20th century, you would expect it to reflect what people thought paganism should be. And in fact, there's a lot of stuff that's not there that should be there. Uh, one of the prime examples being a dying and reborn God. Mm -hmm. There was no dying and reborn God in the material that, that Gardner had. There was a God who was the king of the dead, you know, but there was no dying and reborn God. And as we learned more about late antiquity, we discovered, um, as Jonathan Z. Smith wrote, you know, dying, having a dying and reborn God in the Mediterranean was very much a Christian innovation. You had gods who died, gods who died and became the Lord of the dead, gods who died and like their thumb stayed, you know, their, their toe stayed moving, you know, things like that. But actually to have a, or gods who died and then they were remade into somebody else. But to actually have a dying and reborn God was not typical. But everyone, thanks to Fraser, assumed that was the case. Right. right. So to have something that is possible, you know, the argument is that it was created by Gardner in the mid 20th century. It should have a dying and reborn God. So much so that it develops one. But it's not there in the material he inherits. So the more I started finding a confluence here, the more I started thinking, yes, there is a genuine path here to antiquity. Um, so this let me looking, trying to figure out, okay, what could that path be from the path from, you know, from them to us? And the problem I had, and this will get into the, the question you want to ask later, all of the accounts on late antique Neoplatonic theurgy ended with the practitioners going off to the East. And yeah. all of the accounts of Neoplatonism in Neoplatonic magic in Europe started with folks coming from the East, you know? What was going on in the East, in the middle? And the more you look into that, the more you find Haran. That's where people went and that's where people came back from. Uh, and this was not only a huge surprise to me since this was a confirmed Celtophile of Scottish ancestry, um, I never thought I'd be tracing craft to the Near East. Um, it was also a bit of a blow since as a confirmed Hellenophile since childhood, who, was all, who had always thought of the Turks as the bad guys, uh, I never thought up, I thought I'd be tracing the craft to Turkey. So I gathered as much as I could on Haran and the Sabians, aided very, very much by Brandy, <laughs> who had already started studying the place and its history and the Sabians, and like me, kindly in the days before sending e files, sent me off Xeroxes, you know, files and files of Xeroxes of, of fantastic articles, uh, journal articles on Haran. That had maps. This was maps. this was the great thing about those articles. Yeah. And I'm gonna bring those up. And oh actually, and yeah. there's a 
there's a development off that that you should know about from the HP. Let me remind me, HP Lovecraft Historical Society, Haran. Okay. It's on the list. Yeah, going I'm going, I'll very... ask the question, which was, um, I'm, I'm thrilled because we wanted to get to this too. Um, Don to went to Haran mm -hmm. and I, I'd love you to talk about that, what you know about Haran and to show us something about that. And I know that all of our, um, all of our viewers who are interested in theurgy are gonna be um, extremely fascinated by this. So we were left with basically, you know, well, there's only so much we could get here. So we thought the only way we're gonna find out what we need to do is we need to go to Haran. Um, so we went to Haran and uh, sites around it in 1998, in 2005, and 2008, and uh, much to our surprise, we fell in love with Turkey. Uh, during the trips, we spoke with local scholars and clerics, with museum directors and monks, with the head of Turkey's Department of Antiquities, um, who didn't really have a hell of a lot more to tell us um, at the time. There just hadn't been much work done. Um, more has been done now. Um, but there hadn't been much done. Um, we also made a few discoveries of our own, which I'll, I'll mention later. So at this point, after pursuing several possible paths of where crafts came from, um, I ended up with believing that, okay, yes, it descends from Neoplatonic theurgy of late antiquity through a path that I think is traceable. Um, and where we start to brush up against that problem. Well, I'm still thinking about it as we go. We'll see what happens. The glue that holds that path together is who are the god and who are the goddess. Um, because certain names and identities kept popping up over and over and over again at every stage along the path. And uh, that's the thing that has really made me hold to, to the idea that there is a significant link here, a significant path. Um, the problem, of course, is that these are no longer the names or even identities of the gods anymore. So it's not anything that was in, not anything at the book when I swore to it as, as an initiate, but it probably was oathbound to the people when they were working with it. <laughs> oh, so it's kind of like, I, I'm still mulling. We'll see where we go here. Yeah, I was going to say that I, I think you're on territory that we hadn't actually talked about before. So maybe we want to come back to, um, her, <laughs> to keep so, you out of trouble, uh, to Haran, which is... Mm -hmm. uh, um, you're the only person I know who's gone there and you've done some, you and Anna have done some amazing work. Yeah, so I wanted to, so it's gonna bring up some some information here now. So let's see if the, if the whole slide sharing number will work, okay? That Fingers didn't... crossed. Yeah, right. <laughs> For uh, me, help. Huh, that's the usual thing of, I think I have to open something first. Ah. Uh, um, and then it, and then it finds it. Yeah, you had a bunch of stuff to open. There we go. And I'm gonna move from there. Does that work? Can you see the, the slide image? Yes. Yep. Okay. You're there. So this is from the article, one of the articles that Brandy shared with me. Um, this was a map of, of Haran and you can see where it's right at this uh, crossroad um, of part of the, the Silk Road actually went across here and over. Um, and incense trade routes and other right up here, Haran. And it's in between, it's literally in Mesopotamia. It's between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And the original, the earlier name Haran Ur meant, uh, some people say trade route, some people say baking heat. Um, and it was in the middle of just a an barren arid plain, um, but it was an extremely important crossroads in antiquity. And uh, as some folks know, I'm not sure how much we've already talked about it, at the end of late antiquity, as the the uh, teachers at the academy, as the pagan teachers were basically being shut down, a number of them left and went to the east, where the Persian emperor said, "Cool, let me set you up in a university." And he did that at Haran, and they maintained a school there of Platonism, by which we would actually think now Neoplatonism, um, up until about the year one thousand. Um, and then Haran suffered a very, very strange defeat. Hmm. The, they were overrun by the Mongols and the Mongols looked at this city and Haran had always basically survived by opening its door to whoever showed up. And so the Mongols said, well, if we leave this place, they're just gonna hand themselves over to the next people that come along. Um, and if we garrison it, we're really putting a lot of people in the middle of nowhere. Um, but the city walls are really too, too big and too useful to ignore. So their solution was to deport the populace, wall up the city gates and leave it. 
And Haran just sat there empty for centuries and gradually filled in with essentially windblown dirt. And so there's something that's probably akin to a Near Eastern Pompeii sitting there uh, waiting for discovery. And that was part of what I got really interested in. So this is what the university at Haran looks like today. And actually, I hate to say it, it looks kind of better than this. Uh, there are some people who think that the tower on the right, which was originally an observatory and then became a uh, minaret for call to prayer, might have been the inspiration for the tower card in the Tarot. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, in the interest of trying to rebuild the place, they fixed all that big gap up at the top, so it doesn't look like the Tarot card anymore. Um, but this was the university. There was a small temple to Sin, the moon god, over in the far right corner. This is where Julian's body was brought to lay in state after he died, the only city that, that accorded him honors when he died. Um, on the left here, you can see what the Huronian plain looked like for many, many years. But then they built a dam on the Euphrates and to make the Ataturk, the Ataturk Dam, to make the Ataturk Reservoir, et cetera. And now they could start uh, irrigating. And people have started irrigating like crazy, such that they went from the baking heat desert to malaria is now one of their biggest health problems um, because there's so much standing water. So it's a problem. In the middle of it, down there you see the pin, is Haran, right there. And the city walls are acting as sort of a dike around it so that the water that's in the in, all around it is not flooding the site itself yet. But eventually it's going to basically make its way under the walls and come up again. So anything that's still there in the way of texts, because people probably didn't take every single copy of every text with them when they fled, um, is going to be destroyed. So a lot of these images come when I was working with the university here and their Central Asia Silk Road project trying to get a, a, a a conference together on the urgency of this. So here's one of the maps from Randy uh, compared with the site itself. And you can see that it's a big set of city walls um, around a central tell, a mound, and the university, which became the great mosque right up here, and down in the right-hand corner, the citadel. And the tell and the citadel are the only things that were tall and so they're above the level of the city walls. So they're still like above ground level, the current ground level. Um, and the mosque was area be kept, cl kept clear because that was the first university in the history of Islam. Um, but the rest of it blew in and became filled with nomad huts. Now, unfortunately, more permanent houses. Um, so this is what it looks like today. Hmm. And as houses, those are the nomad huts up to the left, what were known as beehive huts and then more permanent dwellings going in, which is a problem because in Turkey, there's no eminent domain law to start you know, excavating. So the more people just start building on this site, even though it's illegal, the harder it becomes to dig. Um, on the tell, because it was higher, there's been some excavation done, but one of the problems with excavation in a Muslim country is they've reached the level of Islamic occupation and it is difficult to dig further down than that. Hmm. If you reach Islamic ob op occupation level, then there becomes issues of possibly finding remains and possibly finding a grave or a, or, you know, a tomb of some sort. And these can't be disturbed. So then you end up having an imam on site. You have to review all of your digging with the imam at the end of the day, who then approves what you can do the next day. Um, it gets complicated. So the work on the site hasn't gotten older than the uh, medieval period. And the arch, that's the entry to the, to the university space. Um, what was student teacher housing at the university. Um, and the tower that was a, uh, like I said, an observatory originally. And next to it at the base is this one section that's unlike everything else there that has black basalt flooring. And that's brought from mountains far away. And that was a temple. Um, there was in one of the articles from, from the 50s, when uh, Europeans were doing work there, they dug a small opening and looked down enough to see that there is in fact a chamber under this floor, um, but to date, no one's opened it. No one's been there. Um, and this back, black basalt flooring is only found one other place, and that's in a chapel inside the citadel. And this is the citadel. 
what's left of it, which you can walk through and suddenly there's an opening to another layer below. Um, this is what's called, the, the uh, on the left is the mosque, on the right is the chapel. These are two rooms that are built next to each other in the citadel, such that the, uh, the minbar in the, in the mosque is pointed into the chapel, which is kind of unusual because when you're praying there, you're actually praying into the Christian space. But these were both, both built, uh, built during the Crusades. Um, and the presence of the Christian chapel there is a little weird. Um, this area was never held by Christians. Um, so it's a little unclear what it's doing there. It is in style and design virtually identical to the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount, which does raise this whole Templar thing. Um, but while Crusaders held the nearby city of Edessa, um, there's no evidence of Crusaders ever holding uh, Haran. And there's no clear evidence of Templar present, presence at Edessa. There are people who later became Templars who were at Edessa, but there's no indication that Templars as such were ever at Edessa. So this weird little, you know, side-by-sideness of Christian and, and Muslim in a Muslim citadel is just kind of interesting and weird to look at. By the way, down at the far right corner there, that's Glenn Turner. Oh. <laughs> So see Haran in the middle of this plain, but this is a site that, of, of map that we got from Nuritan Yardimchi, who was the, the head of the uh, antiquity service there, a map he had made of every archeological site in the, in the Haranian plain. Um, and the city up to the left here, Urfa, that in the crusader time was known as Edessa. Um, but you can see it's just packed. Like every time you see a mound somewhere, it's an archeological site. Um, and all of these are now threatened. By the, by the increased irrigation. Okay. Um, and also I'll just mention that Edessa at the upper left um, was a Christian site and Haran was a pagan city till very late. And as the area converted to Christianity, Edessa's fortunes prospered. And as it grew, it sank more wells. And as it sank more wells, it, dro it dried up the uh, water table that fed Haran. Mm. So it was one of the reasons that Haran became more and more uh, desertified. So one of the interesting sites I want to mention connected with this is over in the, the mountains to the right. Those are the Tech Tech Mountains, and it's called Sumatar Harabesi. Um, and one of the best books on Haran out there is City of the Moon God um, yeah. by, is it Tamara James? Does I remember? What's her last name? Green, I think. Green, thank you. Tamara Green. Um, and she discussed uh, the Sumatar Harabesi in some detail, and that prompted us to want to go look for it. And it was a temple complex of the Haranians that had uh, temples, little temples on diff seven different hills, each one in a different geometric shape related to a different deity. And it was supposed to be out here in the Tech Tech Mountains. And we asked people at Haran, well, how do you get there? And they said, well, go east and you'll find it. <laughs> Which basically meant asking people directions, stopping for every shepherd and, you know, eventually making our way and finding it. And it's out here in the middle of these mountains. And there is, in fact, a north-south road you can kind of see here that would have been easier to get there by if we'd known about it. And this little triangle here, which is a military outpost to control trade across from Turkey into Syria. And then up at the point of it, another little triangle. And this is Sumatar Harabesi. And the, the uh, planetary temples are on these hills in an arc. And there's a central mound right here. Mm -hmm. And the only map that existed of this site was in one of the articles Brandy gave us. It was a sketch map made in 1953. And it said, OK, here are the mounds with all the planetary temples on them, numbered and labeled them, and a citadel, which was a small fortress, and the central shrine, he called it, which was basically a big flat hill flat stone surface hill, such that you could stand on it and look at all these planetary temples around here. Mm -hmm. And each one of the planetary temples had a different shaped building and then an underground chamber. And in each case, the entry to the underground chamber pointed at the central shrine. So instead of all pointing north or whatever, they all pointed sort of radially at this central shrine. And we thought, I, my immediate thought was, I wonder if these are any kind of astronomical, you know, like sightings. You know, anything like that. You can't tell a hell of a lot from this map. Um, all you can tell is that it's kind of stretched 
uh, the slightest stretch uh, north and south. So we went there and there's that, we took with us a, uh, our cameras, of course, and we took with us a compass and we took a GPS device, which back then was like the size of a larger than a handheld sat phone. And the embassy had said, no problem. We got it there and the guide said, whatever you do, don't let anyone see that you have this. Mm -hmm. Um, because it can be used to call in a mortar strike. Oh, right. And we'd already on the way there gone through things where we'd like flown into an airport and had to dodge mortar shell poles impacts to get. We were the first people in this part of Turkey since it had been taken back from the Turks from being Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. And so every now and then we'd have, a, have to stop for a military checkpoint where they would get us out of the car, keep us, you know, under guard with automatic weapons while they searched our car, you know, and then let us go on, et cetera. So we got kind of used to having automatic weapons pointed at us. Um, and this was the checkpoint out there. And we realized that as we were up on the mountains making our measurements, these people were watching us with binoculars. Oh. So one of the things we did is we would stand up on a point with our camera, like fiddle with our camera and stuff and turn our back to the checkpoint, drop it, pull out the GPS device, do our little things, drop it, pick up the camera and turn around and fiddle some more. Um, so they didn't see what we were doing. Um, but this is the citadel, what's left of it. This is the top of the central mound just below the top, which is or the only known humanoid carvings there of Sin, the moon god. And the top of this mound is just covered with inscriptions that basically just say, may so-and-so be remembered to Sin. Mm -hmm. That's it. Some are in uh, uh, Syriac and some are in, a few, very few are in Greek, um, but that's it. Nothing particularly surprising. Um, like this. Tons of them. But actually, let me step back to that for a moment. But one of the things that is very weird is that when you're also on this big flat rocky surface, there's no indication of there ever being a temple there at all. It's just a big flat surface. For one thing, if all these inscriptions were there, anything that was a temple would cover it. Um, so big flat surface that's for some reason all of the mounds are looking at. So this is one of them. This is the, this is the temple of Saturn on the left um, and the temple of Venus on the right. And you can see that Saturn is round all the way while Venus is round on a square base. And these kind of distinctions are specified in, in some of the texts about the temples of the Heronians, which allows you to identify. Them. And then like one will be a square temple, one will be, I think the one of the sun is rectangular, um, all these very specific shapes. And each of them has, as I said, this passage looking out. One of the things we noticed was that if you stood in that passage and looked at the central mound, you do in fact look right across the surface of the mound at the far horizon, which really then made us go, mm, is this kind of sighting or not? So we dutifully took all these measurements. Um, so this is looking out really far away, really, e really easy to see here. So like there's one of the temples up on the hill over there. There's another one up on here. <laughs> really not easy to see, pretty barren, pretty desolate. The hills are all at least a half a mile away from the central mound. A um, lot, lot of hiking. So this was the sketch map. After coming home and marking all these things with, marking all the actual GPS coordinates, it looks like this. So you can see that rather than being stretched north to south, it's stretched east to west. Um, we also discovered on one of our, we made three trips there. On one of the later trips, we also discovered that there are at least two more hills uh, further out. Um, one of them's in the shape of a vesica piscis. Um, and the, the last one was too degraded for me to be able to tell what the shape was, but it had the passage going down. And from the central mound, you never really noticed that they, that they were there. But once you were at those places much further out, there would be little gaps in the hills where you could see, yes, I do have a straight shot to the central mound. So there are more temples than are marked here. And so I go, oh, cool. Okay, first accurate map of these things ever. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought, well, you know, I took, I took compass bearings from them to the central mound, from the central mound to them. I wonder what the compass bearings are. Well, you know, they should look like this. Okay. Um, and I figured, okay, they're all going to be off by whatever the local variance is, you know, some degrees. Okay. They're not. 
And unfortunately, because this is a recorded program, <laughs> I can't show you the next slide. Oh. They are all off by wild amounts up to 20 degrees at a distance of a half a mile, converging at one point on the site. At one point on the site, there is something that is exerting a tremendous magnetic field. Hmm. And I've talked, I've gone over it with the local ar archeologists, I've showed it to, to astronomers and others who say, the only explanation is a, me is a meteor. Mm -hmm. um, or something made of meteoric iron. So we have examined, we've gone back. Now, one of the things we've discovered in going back to the site is any place we pay too much attention to is dug up the next time we're there. Oh no. Because people think we're looking for treasure. Right. That's why I'm not gonna put the map up. Right. Um, because we've gone back and determined, yes, in fact, there is an opening into the ground just where these things converge. It's sealed, it's full. So it's kind of like we have a treasure map and we can say the treasure's right here under the X and we know it's there, <laughs> but we can't dig it up. We've talked with the local, you know, we've, we've along the way we've informed the local uh, museum. And they've said, you know, all the measurements you want, sure, you know. But right when we made the last sort of discoveries, there was a scandal. The local museum director, whose brother was really involved in the local mafia, had a, an issue. And, you know, so we haven't conveyed the last report to them telling them, here's the X and here's where it is. Um, but if we do anything like, in fact, even then, when we said, well, we, they converge here, we've got to check this place out. So we did the thing of go, okay, we'll walk from here to there. And while we're walking, you know, let's look at the compass. And of course, we get right to the slide and the compass, and the compass goes bloop and flips you know as we walk past it um so we know exactly that's not the x by the way that's something that right there is something called pognon's cave which is the cave of initiation of priests of the moon god um the actual site is somewhere else i'm not gonna the, that is not the x marks the spot i don't want to give anybody that idea <laughs> unfortunately the cave of initiation of priests of the moon god is now a goat pen and latrine for the uh, local community oh no um, um yeah unfortunately gotta, gotta... ammonia is really breaking havoc with the carving oh, too. no doubt um if you want to drop out of the the presentation so we don't so, <laughs> we don't go for um if you want to so yeah, yeah if you can if you'll stop the recording uh no 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 um i was just saying um go um drop out of the presentation oh yeah yeah oh, okay okay or stop stop screen so, sharing so but anyway but the fact that it'd be recorded and it would be up somewhere anybody yeah, could yeah. say i'm gonna no, go look because for that what i was going to say um so, so so i don't want i don't want that to happen but right. there's something fascinating to find there. Um, another thing that's so, interesting um, about this site. If you, would, um, if you would stop screen sharing for a second. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I will. Um, I'll, I'll uh, address that too. So thank you for thank you for sharing that and for for talking to us about it. And also, um, I we have colleagues. Um, I, I presume that if if colleagues contacted you privately, you could share more information with them than um, than you were able to share with the the general public, sort of in a in a recording. <laughs> um, and and that that is fantastic work. Um, obviously, we all get really kind of fired up and want to to say what can we do to help. And I'm I'm really glad that you're working with the university and talking to them about that and talking to the museum about how to preserve these sites and how to get more information. It makes me long for you know our own pagan university that had money. Right, really. <laughs> so the uh, uh, so the thing that was weird about about it is I'm thinking there's one last thing about it, which is also quite feeds into the story and just to make it a wonderful Indiana Jones story. Um, <laughs> many of the chambers that are under the, the temples will have a little sunken opening hole in one area. And we sort of, oh, okay, something for putting an urn or something. And the last time we were there, uh, Greg Stafford, who founded the Chaosium Game Company, some people may know died mm -hmm. yeah. recently, noted that in one of those holes, the dirt had actually sunk enough that you could see that the lip went like this. And that it wasn't just a hole, it was the roof of another chamber. And that there are chambers under the ones that are not relative, not well known. And given that this area is very close to, to Cappadocia and places like you know Kaimakli and Derinkui, it wouldn't be a big surprise if there were tunnels under this place. So there might be quite a bit to discover at Sumatar. And I'm hoping that that iron thing, it may just be an lump of iron, but it could be a you know, it could be a statue. 
Who knows? Right. But you know, something's something's there and it's underground and we know where it is. <laughs> well, you've you've been there three times. Do you have any um any plans to to return um again? It looks like uh, it's on the Syrian border, so it looks a little scary. You're, it's it's, it's a difficult scary. area. I mean, the last time we were there, we already there were already lots of refugees mm. that were moving into areas. And I would bet that a number of the caves that we've looked at are now have people living in them. Um, but it's it's yeah, it's not the safest area. Um, in fact, when we were, you know, we, we took so much time getting to there the first time that when we were coming back, it was getting dark. Um, and we were warned before leaving the city at the time, they said, if you are, if don't be back out of the city after dark, because they said, if someone tries to flag you down and it's a government, an army patrol and you don't stop, they will kill you. And they said, if someone flags you down and it's a PKK patrol and you do stop, they will kill you. So they said, basically, just don't be out of the city after dark. Um, and we had the luck on the way back that our guide said, you know, we could stop off over here. There's a small Yezidi town, town, you know, extended family. And we went and had a wonderful experience with the Yezidi uh, there, which led to a whole process, interfaith process of returning their scripture to them. And, you know, just a whole long, another interesting story if you want to go into, but, you know, more than for here, probably. Um, but that was fascinating to make contact and, and sort of have an interfaith sharing of, of practices with the Yazidi uh, in Turkey, in Eastern Turkey. Um, we also, as you saw some of the pic picture when we started, we were in 2005, we were there as part of a group invited by the uh, people of the town Turgut, who are next to the, the uh, temple of Hekate at Lagina, which is the only Hekate temple that's dedicated, just a site dedicated just to her not her as part of another crew. Um, and they were reviving the Hecatesia, the fall festival of Hecate. And they invited a group of pagans to come initiate the process or inaugurate the process. And as well as being part of the original, like the big festival that where the whole town gathered and we had crescent cakes and honey wine and the archaeologists explained thing. The next night, the night of the full moon, they gave to our small group and said, the place is yours till midnight. And so we were able to celebrate rites to Hecate in her temple for the first time there probably in over a thousand years wow um, which was pretty that's pretty remarkable and that site's being developed nicely um it's just the local town feels cut out of the loop that like buses will come in from the coast see the the temple and leave and the locals won't get any kind of bit of that money so they mm -hmm. were trying to encourage local local tourism um so also on on one of these tips the the head of the museum in town uh, it was 2005, said to us, would you be interested? In, we said, is there anything else we don't know about that we should go see that wouldn't be? And they said, would you be interested in the oldest temple ever found? And we sort of went, sure. And they said, well, here. And got out this map and drew stuff in pencil, said, go here, then ask one of the villagers to show you. And of course, it was Gebekli Tepe. And people, nobody knew about it yet. And so we were there before anything was fenced off or covered. And we were able to walk around the site and visit everything. I mean, we were expecting a rock with a hole in it. You know, and when we saw the place in the megaliths, we were just absolutely blown away. So uh, that was pretty amazing. Um, but so all of these have been sort of around Haran and Sumatar as being, you know, Sumatar as a temple complex of Haran, um, mm -hmm. as being a place we've been trying to uh, get more attention to. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot there to learn. I mean, you've got to know that as these people are being told, you got to pack up your belongings and get out that schools there that have masses of documents, okay, okay, let's take two copies of that when they may have 10, right? You know, and so there's gotta be just tons of stuff there, tons of stuff there. Um, and it's all gonna be destroyed. So, mm -hmm. you know, we just try to get uh, academic interest in, uh, I've, it's, it's come to the point, as people have said, the last resort turning to National Geographic. Oh gosh. Because they always say that's the last resort. Uh, because National Geo if it's an interesting story, they're very interested, and then they'll take over everything. Mm -hmm. said, and they can get all the permits, and they can get everything, but it'll be the National Geographic story, and they'll do whatever they want. And you know, but it seems like that's probably the last resort to, to talk to and see if they'll be interested. So I think so. I hope so. We'll see. Well, 
Um, I'm going to say that we have uh, another stack of material that we wanted to go through, but we're we're sort of out of our uh, out of time. We try to keep oh. these hour. So <laughs> what I want to do is I, no, gosh, no. This was whatever so, you want to talk to. You tell me. Uh, what I want to do is say I want to I want to have you back <laughs> to to come back and and pick up some of the other things that um, we had um, prepped to talk about, including your trips to um, Egypt, Kemet, and your Kemetic work and how that um, uh, interacts with your theurgy. Um, but um, in particular, uh, I, I wanted to ask you what you've been doing lately. We usually end with that. And, and you had a, a pin in talking about the Lovecraft Society. And I know that Hercules has a special interest in that. So I'd, I'd like you to, to hit oh, that if you can. Yeah, I just want it's one of the things. I mean, the first thing I've got to say, and I don't come if I don't, the library. Yes. Addisenton Research Library. It's addisentonlibrary.org, which is a pagan library in the East Bay. We've now reached a little over 17,000 volumes. Um, plus a room, a room of periodicals. And if ever you can go to addisentonlibrary.org and, and dig through our catalog and see what we've got. Um, we recently expanded and uh, our space, um, which is how I recently injured my leg. I just came from an MRI before we started, which was really painful. Um, so anyway, so it's, it's slowed things down a little bit, but we'll be opening soon. Um, but the thing that, that, that came up about Egypt and about HPL, the reason I wanted you to put a pin in it, um, I was ordering something from the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society and they mentioned, I said, oh, you guys will be interested in the library. And they said, oh, and I, I said, here's the information. They said, we were planning to open on when I returned from my last trip to Egypt, but pandemic started. And they said, last trip, how many times? I said, well, seven so far. And seven, I said, yeah, you know, Egypt, blah, blah, blah. Here, you might be interested in the baboon catacombs. And I sent them off all this stuff about the baboon catacombs. And as a result, I found myself the member of the month uh, for I think it was either February or March in 2020, 2022. And it got me thinking about all the different stories that I will tell people, things like this, things that are not written down. Mm -hmm. um, especially things with Lovecraftian bents, like you know the, the, the hidden tunnels under Alexandria um, that most people don't know about and now can't get into. Um, things like that, you know, cool, cool, weird things that are great for a, a uh, the, the labyrinth under Knossos and rooms there that people don't know about. Um, so weird ship, excuse me, but I thought it would be great for uh, Lovecraft things. So I started sending them all this stuff. And two things came out of that. One, they want me to write a monograph as a Miskatonic professor about the mythos in Egypt, you know, from the point of view of, of course, this is real. Um, but their latest monograph is about finding a, a, a fragment of the Necronomicon at Haran. And it's because one of the stories that I wrote down for them was all about doing the stuff at Haran and Sumatar Harabesi, using documents provided by Brandy originally. <laughs> and they said, this is great. We want to use this in writing a monograph. And so if you get the monograph, you'll see that I have this one in the bibliography at the back. Remember this thing supposedly written in the 20s. It has in like 1890 something book by Don Fru. That, that's my credit. Um, <laughs> But they use maps and things that you'll find familiar. Oh gosh! Because um, they're from those articles, um, and they even found photos of Haran from the 1920s uh, wow. to put in there. So all of this weaves back around and comes to the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, which is a fun group, and uh, and they have fun products. So, but you at least they've prompted me to start writing down all these things because otherwise, you know, great story, tell it over and over again, and then it'll be gone. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. Right, right, right. I'm really glad to have you um, have an, a, an interview with you. Um, it's it's fantastic. And I, I will I'll send you an email and we uh, see if I can schedule you to come back somewhere like at the um, at the back end of the year. Um, if people wanted to get in contact with you and talk to you, how could they get in contact with you? Um, if they're interested in me personally, it's uh, should I put it put it in chat or what should we do? Um, so we usually, um, what, what's publicly available, so I'll, I'll say, you know, you can contact me at brandywilliamsauthor.com, mm -hmm. um, and I'm also on Facebook and Instagram mm -hmm. as Brandy Williams Author. Do you have a public presence like that? Not nearly, no. I've stayed out of most social media completely. You're a PIO, um, you're a PIO. But the, uh, uh, I know, but that's, it, I don't know how people have the time. I mean, if I go through my, going through my email, There'll be one email and crafting a, a reply to it, knowing that it may be reproduced somewhere, will take a couple of hours. Right. You know, I don't know how people manage to handle tons of it. 
So, I mean, since we know anything can be reproduced, you've got to be extremely careful. I've got to go check those dates. I've got to check that quote. I've got, you know, everything else. So for me personally, it's a uh, dhfru3 at gmail.com. Yeah. Um, if people want to contact us about the library, it would be info at adacentumlibrary.org. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the library opening. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we have some photos of it and such if you want to see. So, anyway, I, I'm sorry I took so much time on things. I know all, most of these things that you ask, you're like, God, that's, that's a whole program in itself. I mean, so, but if you'd like to talk more, I'm always happy to. I'd love to. And um, we had um, put a pin in a couple of conversations about around the, the deities. I know that you want to have a chance to think through what you want to say in public. So I kind of um, I put that aside, but let's come back to that and your work in Egypt and anything else that you want to talk about. It's It's been fantastic. I know that um, my my theurgic colleagues are going to be thrilled to, to watch the presentation. So thank you so much for, for making the time for us. Anything else you want to say? Like last no, words? I, just, we go? I, 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 real, I do great with questions. You know, rather than trying to figure out what do people already know or want to see. So ask whatever you want. And I love it. So great. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. I Thank learned so, so much from this presentation. Um, I haven't shared this with you yet, Brandy, but we're going to be, have, be having a cable show in the next uh, month or so, as well as cool. the, that we currently have. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned so much from uh, this uh, um, episode that create specials on Sundays when you guys are free, just so we can continue the conversation and not wait until the tail end of the year. So okay. sure, just let me know. You know, I don't know if you if you see it, but for the first time ever doing this, I seem to have a ghost in the yes, uh, catacombs next to me. <laughs> I've never seen that before in doing a, a talk. So hmm, must be there you guys. Go. Something will no, it's you. <laughs> so All one right. of the baboon that Thoth is manifesting through one of the baboon spirits wanting to say something. Okay. Okie doke. Just let thank me know you when. So much. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Hercules. And um, hi, hi, Anna. And thank you for, for joining. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thanks to all of you. This, this was awesome. Bye-bye.